I first learned about Dr. Fisher when um, Rocket Science Retailing came out in the Harvard Business Review, and it was about using uh, data to help improve uh, the retail supply chain. And it was really at, the point, at that point quite innovative. And it, I think it went into a book as well. Um, then in the year 2000, Dr. Fisher actually founded a company called 4R Systems, which works on inventory and assortment planning optimization. And it's a company that I've actually worked with um, also in the past and does a lot of work with um, key retailers. And I think he's the chairman of the board right now. Um, and then also uh, I met Dr. Fisher when we were in the consortium for operational excellence in retailing, which was a, um, an industry group that got together and kind of brainstormed mm -hmm. uh, retail supply chain and solutions for it. So today um, he's gonna be presenting um, about the value of social media data and fashion forecasting. So um, quite contiguous with what he's done before. And with uh, no further ado, please welcome Dr. Fisher. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So can everybody see the slides? Um, this is a project I did with a. Yes, we can see it. Yuran Fu, uh, who was in our PhD program, and she came to me in her, in her first year and said she wanted me to be her advisor, which I was happy to do. And then soon thereafter, she had an idea for this project that I want to talk about, uh, which was she said, you know, there's a lot of people who tweet about things like color. What color is going to be hot next? year or next month or whatever. And she said, I bet I could look at those tweets and that would help me predict demand for fashion apparel or footwear. Um, and I thought to myself, that's a crazy idea. How could that possibly work? You know, somebody's out there saying I like blue and then three months later, people are gonna buy blue. But I figured I'd let her try it and, and she would eventually see it didn't work and then we could figure out something else uh, to work on. But boy, oh boy, I got to give her credit. She made this work. Uh, and she was a scrappy person. She figured out that from Twitter, you could get a three month history of tweets for free. Um, and so she just kept doing that throughout the five years in the PhD program. By the end of her time, we built up this arsenal of four or five years of, of tweets. I'll tell you more details, but for more than 1,300 people who tweeted about fashion. Some of them were the brands themselves. I'll show you a list in a little bit. Um, and, and so my contribution was to create uh, recruit three retailers to work with us on this project. And they were all leading retailers, I think, uh, all had about 50 years of history, two apparel, one footwear. Uh, revenues range from, I think, 3 billion to maybe 20 or 30 billion. So substantial, well-recognized, recognized, but asked to be anonymous retailers. Uh, two apparel, um, one footwear. Um, and so you see some examples of their products there. <clears throat> Um, and so what Euron did was to collect tweets about color in a fashion sense uh, from 1,300 bloggers over a long period of time. And then also we had sales data from these retailers. And typically for these retailers, and this is pretty typical of fashion except for Zara, they'll have maybe a, a two or three month season two seasons a year, sometimes three or four. Uh, footwear is typically two seasons, two six month seasons. And maybe three months before the start of the season, they're figuring out, they're predicting how much they're gonna sell of each of the different style colors. They're predicting, you look at those pictures, uh, that would be a, a unit of forecast for them. How much am I gonna sell of that item? Um, and then typically that's what they order. Uh, they may reorder if they can get it, hot sellers. But in the three retailers we worked with, the initial order was 
of their eventual uh, season sales, okay? And so what Yaron did was collect tweets and use them to create a better forecast at that point in time at the start of the season or three months prior to the start of the season when the retailer was placing their order, okay? And then we can compare that to the, the retailers, um, uh, what they actually forecast. Okay, so outline. I wanna give a little bit of background on the state of the art of forecasting fashion products and compare two models. Uh, make what's selling is the model made famous by Zara. So they uh, will have about a two week lead time to get more product into their stores. They actually can produce and deliver to their stores within two to three weeks. So they're producing now what's currently selling or what they think will be selling in three weeks based on very recent sales data. That uh, contrasts with the sell what you've made model. Um, I once in the work with retailers, um, we worked with Gap and, and Jenny Ming who headed up Old Navy at the time. And she took us on uh, a tour of stores and she said, the, the most important thing in retailing is you stand for something. You know, we said, what does that mean? She pointed this huge stack of fleece tops and said, well, this year it's fleece, okay? So that's the sell what you've made model. It's take a position which you think is gonna be what's important in three to four months out uh, in apparel fashion, and you, you are the cheerleader for that particular fashion, okay? You're not really trying to predict demand, you're trying to shape demand, okay? Uh, so I want to give you a little bit of background on those, those two thoughts about fashion, um, and then talk about what we did, uh, okay? So here's some data from a couple projects I'd done with various colleagues that are listed there, where we worked with apparel, in one case, an online retailer, and the other was uh, Sport Obermeyer, who made fashion ski wear and supplied it to um, ski shops. But in both those projects, we were looking at, at the start of the season, before they had any sales data, what they thought would sell. So each blue dot is a style color. So it's like the pictures I'm showing you there, okay? Uh, that's the unit of forecast. Uh, and along the x-axis is what they predicted. And the y-axis, is actual demand, okay? <laughs> Someone joked that that looks like a pattern a shotgun would make, but it is better than that. There is a positive correlation between actual sales and forecasts, but a pretty big uh, margin of error. You just look in this case where they're predicting a thousand and sales range from a hundred or in each blue dot, there is a style color of apparel um, so sale, actual sales range from as low as 100 to as much as uh, 3,000. So you can think about what you call we call that, but it's hundreds percent forecast error, okay? Um, here's a couple styles from one of the retailers we worked with. And a quote that the CEO of this retailer uh, made to us was, there's nothing as boring as last season's hot seller. So in one season, in the sweaters or tops that are shown there, uh, one of them came in gold and gold was red hot. You can see the gold sales line, it shoots up. And then the reason it falls is they started stocking out of gold and you see other colors uh, come up because they couldn't, couldn't get gold. And then you look next year at the bottom table and gold was nowhere. Okay, so things are... Um, are let's see unpredictable within the season uh, in any one season, and what's hot one year is boring and dead the next year. So both within a particular season and then over time, year over year, uh, the idea of using history to predict uh, would be. Um, a fool's errand, okay? Uh, if you use gold sales to predict the next season, uh, it wouldn't do you any good at all. Okay, so, and here's some macro data that shows the results of that. Uh, the NRF, National Retail Federation, used to collect data on markdowns 
as a percentage of full price. And you see that graph going to 31%, which would mean uh, that the average item sold at a 31% discount. Okay. Now, why does it end in 1995? It was becoming so embarrassing, they stopped publishing it. But informally, I've heard numbers like around 40% uh, markdown. So the average item might start at $100. This is average and, and sell at, uh, at $60. Now, that's a blend of some things. Maybe a third sell at full price, a third sell maybe 40% uh, off, and then a whole bunch sell at 80 or 90% off, or don't sell at all. Okay. Uh, despite that fact, there's a company, Kurt Simmons Associates, that surveys customers, and they report that one the customers say one third of the time when I, I enter a store with a clear idea of what I want to buy, and, and one third of the time I leave because they I can't find the thing I came to buy. So we've got uh, 30, 40% markdowns, and we've got a third of the time people can't find what they want. So either way, we've got too much of some products, not enough of others, okay? Now, what are the different models? The make what selling model is made famous by Zara. In this project I did with Anand Raman that was published in a paper Mark mentioned rocket science retailing and in the book we published, The New Science of Retailing, we found three retailers that had two to three week lead time. Zara is pretty famous. World sells only in Japan, so they're less famous. Um, and then there's a uh, Philadelphia-based maternity retailer, Destination Maternity. All the other retailers had super long lead times, both for design and for replenishment. Now you look at Zara, uh, number one thing of interest, does the model make what's selling work? Yeah, look at the sales data. Uh, I first visited them in 1999. They weren't public. Nobody had heard of them. I would not heard of them. Uh, and they went from number four amongst the four well-known retailers listed there to number one in sales in just a decade. Okay. Uh, why does that model work? Well, remember I, on the left is data I showed you where the initial forecasts were pretty crappy. Um, we looked at updating forecasts within the season, and we saw from prior seasons that two weeks into the season, you would have seen 11% of your eventual sales, right? So if something was going to have sold 11 in the first two weeks, you would expect it to sell 100 by the end of the season. Uh, so we used initial sales to create an updated forecast with the simplest model you could imagine. What I just said, if something sold 11, we predicted 100. Or we, we simply uh, divided initial sales by 0.11 to get uh, a projection of season sales, and the forecasts are almost perfectly accurate. So I think that shows why the Zara model works. They're, uh, that's how they're predicting. They're looking at very recent sales. What did I sell last week? And projecting out uh, from that, what would I expect to sell in a couple of weeks and making more of those things that are selling well. In particular, the two things that sold 3,000, uh, the, the forecast for those was, was 1,000 or 1,500 way off. Uh, but then once you see initial sales, you've got a very accurate forecast. So that's uh, what make what's selling. Um, a, a good friend, uh, Walter Salmon, who is a distinguished professor of retail at Harvard Business School, uh, sadly died two, three years ago, uh, put me in touch with an article, a very old article, 1951, by a guy, Alfred Daniels. And he used the Zara model. This was back in the 50s when his uh, he was uh, head merchant at Abraham Strauss. His office was on uh, the top floor of the, of the well, the, the store was on Fifth Avenue. His office was on the top floor of the very same building. And where was all the production? Seventh Avenue. So he had a, a two block long supply chain. And this is all about how he, it was all manual on cars, not computerized, but he's looking every day at what sold and what didn't sell and uh, and projecting out. 
uh, and he, you know, he uses the word scientific. So it's it's not an old idea, this make what selling model. Uh, and I think what it, why it went out of fashion, if you uh, look at this graph I showed you before, uh, the U.S. recognized China in 1979. Uh, I visited China in 82, uh, spent six weeks teaching a course there. And the only other Americans I saw were buyers from apparel companies. So it didn't take long if you were buying something for $10 and you could buy it in China for less than a dollar to beat a path to China's door. Factories were up and running and you were sourcing from China and it was dirt cheap, but slow, slow, slow. And so now you've got, instead of a two week lead time, sourcing in, uh, I don't know, 7th Avenue, you've got a six month lead time. Uh, and suddenly you've got to order much earlier uh, without any benefit of sales data. Uh, and the result is you, you, you get it wrong, okay? Um, when I visited Zara back in 1999, I asked, I met with their then CEO and asked, I guess, a pretty naive question. How are you guys so fast? And he said, you know, you've seen our process. Our equipment's not anything anyone else can buy. Uh, there's nothing we're doing revolutionary. We just don't understand why everyone else is so slow. Um, and over the years, I, as I met and talked with apparel re, uh, retailers or manufacturers, I, I would pose that question to them. I mean, not to pick on anybody, but Gap, uh, Limited, had these long lead times. Um, <clears throat> The, the biggest answer I got was that cost is a known thing. Uh, the value of a short lead time is less known. So you've got, you know, you can pay $10 to make something in China and get it in three months, let's say, or you can pay $15 to make it locally uh, and get it in two weeks. Uh, you know, the, the typical CFO is DAS is an IQ test. $10 is cheaper than 15. I'll go with the 10. So that that's one point. Um, I think there's also a negative reinforcing cycle that if you can't produce in reaction to sales, then you lose the appetite and ability to actually aggressively look at sales data and make future projections. All it does is break your heart to look at sales data. You, you see what you could have done. Oh, gosh, I wish I bought more of that, but you can't. Okay, And then what some of these retailers would tell me is, well, we think Zara makes cheap stuff, okay? And we have high quality product and that, that takes longer. So a bunch of reasons. Um, so that's a little, little overview of the Zara model. Any questions at this point? The other model, is this the so what you've made model. Anybody see the movie, The Double Wears Prada? Or maybe I'll say maybe some of you did. Uh, this, this is- Yes. My, yeah, favorite scene from that movie. You go to your closet and you select, I don't know, that lumpy blue sweater, for instance, because you're trying to tell the world that you take yourself too seriously to care about what you put on your back. But what you don't know is that that sweater is not just blue, it's not- Turquoise is not lapis, it's actually cerulean. And you're also blindly unaware of the fact that in 2002, Oscar de la Renta did a collection of cerulean gowns. And then I think it was Yves Saint Laurent, wasn't it, who showed cerulean military jackets? I think we need a jacket here. Mm. And then cerulean quickly showed up in the collections of eight different designers. And then it uh, filtered down through the department stores and then trickled on down into some tragic casual corner where you no doubt fished it out of some clearance bin. However, that blue represents millions of dollars and countless jobs. And it's sort of comical how you think that you've made a choice that exempts you from the fashion industry when in fact, you're wearing a sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room. Have you ever seen such arrogance? <laughs> you're wearing what we do, what we picked for you. And so that the and that is, I think, a prevailing view. Um, 
amongst the fashion industry. There were the Mickey Drexlers and the, the, the famous designers who shaped fashion, and they didn't predict what people were, would wear. They told them what to wear. You're wearing the sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room. So one of the interesting things we're going to see in, the, in this, what I want to talk about next, this research is, uh, does that model work? Okay. Um, now, um, how, how would you tell people what to wear? Well, Vogue magazine would be one common way. What's interesting is that the messaging, uh, which was done in print, and the prints, of course, still exists, uh, but the same people that would write in Vogue magazine are now tweeting about fashion. So the upper left is H&M, uh, uh, Michael Kors, Calvin Klein. Um, and their tweets in, can include messages about color, okay? So that's what I want to talk about next, is uh, the effort that, that Neuron Fu did to use those tweets to see if we could better predict fashion products using actual sales data from these three retailers. Uh, and just to recap, three retailers, We've got sales data from all of them. We collected tweets on uh, on color and used it to predict not what color a retailer would sell, but how much they would sell of a particular item, one attribute of which was it was its color. We also extended it to predicting genes where, where a fit is actually a fashion item. So skinny, slim, straight, uh, the things listed there are are uh, stylistic fit options for genes. We also worked on predicting that. Um, there's been a, a, a small but growing literature on using social media. Marketing is kind of, does social media useful as, as sales? Uh, other things have looked at different aspects of social media. We only found one paper that did, that sought to do something very similar to what we're doing. Uh, the paper that's listed at the top there, which is use social media to predict sales of an apparel product, okay? They were, I think, different from us in every way. Their social media was Facebook, uh, not tweets. They were working with men's apparel, not women. And they were predicting not sales of an item in a season, but total sales for the apparel retailer on a day looking um, looking a number of days out okay um and uh, and got good results okay uh we also networked with a bunch of practitioners uh and they were they were aware of social media as a potential input that they should be thinking about and uh, took that into account uh informally you can see the three names listed there work at companies that whose business is forecasting apparel. And a common uh, takeaway from the conversations was, well, I look at it and I, ju I just know it will sell. Um, and they do lots of things, uh, mostly of, of a more artistic nature, judgmental, to try to see where things are headed in the fashion industry. Okay, so the data we had in this project was uh, actual sales, uh, week by week, uh, item by item. And an item, a, a stock keeping unit is a style color of an item plus its size. We did not look at uh, predict size selling distribution. Those are That's usually pretty easy uh, to predict where history actually is useful there. Um, so we're predicting uh, sales uh, in a season of um, a particular style color uh, of an apparel or footwear item. Uh, and then in the for one of the retailers, we all also looked at jeans fit. And then the uh, social data we had were tweets from uh, just over 1,300 fashion bloggers over, I guess, about a four and a half year period, OK? Uh, here's an example of some of the fashion bloggers. So all the brands 
will be putting out tweets, basically advertising their stuff. Um, and then there's some other folks who, who are just uh, fashion commentators. Uh, so you can see some of the leading names listed there. Uh, and I'd shown you before, this is what they're doing. They're putting out tweets with pictures of products. I mean, they tweet about lots of things, but the ones relevant to our research, picture or product, uh, one attribute of which was a color, and they call out that color, okay? Uh, now, uh, what Yaron did was uh, turn these text tweets into an input to a prediction model, okay? And so she initially hired, you used Amazon Turk, uh, would hire for each tweet five people to rate it. And the question she posed is, is this tweet about color in a fashion sense? So uh, blue is going to be hot next year, as opposed to I'm feeling really blue today. Uh, was it uh, positive, neutral, or negative? And then there were some other attributes of the tweets that she captured, okay? But that was the main idea. Here's a tweet. Uh, so this tweet up here would be uh, in the upper left corner. Yes, it's about fashion uh, and about color in a fashion sense. And it's it's positive that true blue is going to be hot. Okay. Um, and then with that training set, uh, she, she applied uh, a number of different online learning models, which I'll show you the results of in a minute that uh, would, would automatically uh, code the tweets. So I think she had, gosh, close to a million tweets. You know, you look at uh, 1,300 bloggers over a four and a half year period, a huge, huge number of tweets, uh, all coded. And maybe the first 5% of them, she had folks manually code. That was their training set, and then she built an algorithm to code all the rest. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, so, yes. Uh, this is Bernita. I'm just uh, reminding everyone you have a chat panel, and you can also raise your hands, and we will see that you are, and you can unmute yourself if you have a question or a statement that you'd like to make. Right. And, and um, maybe I could offer one thought as you're listening to this is, um, it's possible that nobody is interested in the exact context I'm talking about here, predicting fashion apparel. But I think what would be an interesting exercise is what social media might you want to look at? And if you have to do prediction, supply chains usually, supply chain management usually involves predicting demand. That's what drives the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, how well is your current prediction working and could it work? Uh, is there content about consumer preferences in some type of social media that you uh, could use to increase um, increase your forecast accuracy. Okay, so we got a huge number of tweets. The tweets are co coded as to um, uh, as to are they about color in a in a fashion sense? Yeah. I have one hand raised, Jacqueline Bohr. You um, can you unmute yourself? Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Jacqueline Bohr. I was just curious. Did you look at any? Google searches in your study, or was it purely looking at Twitter tweets? We, yes, we looked at Google search. Yes, uh, thank you for reminding me. Um, and uh, again, uh, Yaron was quite resourceful in that you could see search on, I compared six colors. Uh, and so, and Jacqueline, since you raised your hand, how many different colors do you think we discovered amongst the retailers we were working with? How many different colors would a fashion apparel come in? These are colors they have a defined term for. You can yeah. define a color with RGB. 
I mean, I think, you know, they're the basic colors, right? And the color wheel, you think of that break out into what, five or, or 10 or so, but then <clears throat> as each of the companies extrapolate their own versions of the colors, I can only imagine thousands <laughs> that pop up, but um, I'm not sure what, what you actually found in the research. Um, your answer is excellent. Uh, we found, I think, 950 distinct colors, 954, okay? Wow. Uh, and you also, uh, you said the five or six basic colors and then a much richer palette. And I had to live with Yaron throughout the four or five years she was in our program, constantly teasing me about my lack of fashion sense. So if you look closely there, there are color names if you're a guy, red, blue, yellow, and then color names if you're a girl. This is Yaron's perspective, which is a much more nuanced shade. Um, and so your guess of a thousand was, was right on, okay? So, and it, it was also intriguing to me how precise uh, the, the definitions were, there were usually a couple words and they were used pretty consistently by the retailers. And, and each color has a precise uh, label with three numbers, the, the content of red, green, blue, the RGB rating. Mm -hmm. So that you can look at that color and, and precisely identify it. And then that was associated with a name. So a lot of colors. And so that was one of the, the things she, um, she needed to do is cross-reference, if there's a tweet about True Blue, what, which items that this retailer sells is that related to? Where are the True Blues? Okay, another question. Uh, this one is from me, Bernita. Ah. So really not a question as much as of a statement. Um, I'm, I'm a graphic person um, and I receive regular emails. And one of the ones that I get every year is about Pantone. Pantone has released the big color for the year. Yes. And, 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 and it's one of my pet peeves. And then I find it migrating to the clothing shelves, to the, the magazines that sell paint color too. And it's like, it's telling me what I'm supposed to love. Right. And, and yet somehow over time from the constant exposure, I eventually love it. And uh, I think it speaks to what you're discussing now. So, so the interesting question, do you think color preference is mostly coming from those top-down messaging, Pantone color of the year being one of them, I, I forget what their color is this year, some shade of blue, or do you think it comes from consumers and their preference for color? Can I give an example of consumer color preference? In the 60s? Mm -hmm. I, I tend to think that it comes from the top down. thing called tie-dyed shirts, right? Yes, yes, yes. An anti-fashion statement. You could, it was do-it-yourself color. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. You think that top-down is the bigger influence than bottom-up? I do. I do. I should have set up a straw poll here because uh, we could have asked everybody. Well, you could have people raise their hands. <laughs> Yeah, Anish, what do you think? Top down or bottom up? Well, I have a separate question. It, it's actually related to the question before the last caller uh, on on Google searches. And uh, by the way, I'm really enjoying the, the presentation. You were asking about fashion and I find it fascinating. I think you could relate that to a lot of industries. But for, for me, I see, you know, uh, social media being what you want the world to think about you. And I see Google searches more like a truth serum as well as clicks. So therefore I think on fashion, one could look at, you know, colors and dresses um, as, as possibility that could drive, drive sales. But if I was to use social media to predict, let's say confectionery goods, like, you know, chocolate candies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't, I, for me, I'd be embarrassed to tweet that I'm loving eating this big cake all the time, right? And so, and so I, I think that I would probably be clicking and searching to buy that cake 
and and so I would feel like that data is more valuable on the search side than on the social media side. So my so if you agree with me, my question to you is, how do you know when, uh, you know, it, it, are you, you mentioned that you use Google searches? So is it sort of reconciling Google searches with with social media data? You know, how do you know? Is there any kind of rule of thumb you could guide us on and when to use what data um, for, for predictions? Uh, Maybe uh, I'm giving you, I hope I didn't sound too convoluted. No, 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 not at all. It's a great question, Anish. We actually looked at four different uh, predictive things. There was the original tweet, uh, then somebody could retweet that, or they could favorite it, and then we looked at Google search. So we had four. Uh, potential predictors, and I'm going to show you the relative effectiveness of each of the four, okay? And, and also show you the combination of the four, uh, how that works. And and you're on build a predictive model where all four of those were available as predictors. You know, the usual approach, you got a bunch of independent variables, those are the four, and let, let the math tell you which ones are the most important. So in about three slides, I think you'll find it interesting uh, as to oh, which, great. which of the different things were most predictive. I, that's the thing I found most most interesting. Okay. Great. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Any other questions, or can we can we move on here? We actually do have one statement from Dr. Um, Jane. I, it, oh wait, actually, this might be the same question. Uh, I wonder if you found consistent in, in, in result of the favorite color from the data obtained from the different sources, as well as the data obtained from different regions. Uh, did, um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but we okay. did. Okay, I wonder if you found consistency in results about the favorite color from the data obtained from the different sources, as well as the data obtained from different regions. So we didn't really look at a favorite color. Because remember, these retailers sold, we're seeing here, 954 uh, different colors. So they sold a whole array of items. And we weren't so much asking what's the, the, what's the Pantone hot color this year, but rather what is this particular style color going to sell next season? And there were a lot of different style colors along um, uh, with, a, with a variety of different colors. We didn't look uh more granularly than uh the mostly the us okay i can show you a little bit of work comparing the us and europe and we'll get to that in in a couple of slides so um i'm going to move on and what's interesting in the social media about color uh you can see at the top there are retweets over time for a bunch of colors. And then you can see Google search at the bottom. Um, and some consistency, but some um, peaks and valleys, right? You see red pop up uh, and then red decline. And then remember before, we saw the same thing with actual sales. So you see variation in color tweets. Uh, and I guess the red line there was actually retweet. So if you think, people retweet something that they like. Uh, you saw bumps in the red preference in the retweet line. Uh, and then you see a big bump in the preference for gold. So there's variation over time in the preferences that people have for color and obviously season over season. And so the obvious question is, are they correlated? Are they sufficiently correlated that what you see in the tweets, that variation is predictive of the variation you see in sales, okay? So here's how we sought to answer that question. This is the timeline for the retailer. So they had a, a full price selling season. Uh, they had a, a production lead time. Uh, the three lead times are shown there, but they're typically about three months. Um, they varied a little bit. Uh, and so at the time that the retailer was making their initial forecast and placing that with their suppliers to, to source, um, we looked at all the social media data that was available up to that point in time. 
and then Euron incorporated that into a more sophisticated production uh, prediction model. Okay, um, so that was the timing, and she looked at three different models, machine learning models, lasso, search, uh, SVM, and random forest. Random forest worked the best. So here are the results with random forest. So the blue line is the uh, forecast error of the, of the forecast at the style color level developed by the retailer. This is what they predicted versus what they actually sold. Uh, the orange line is, is not using social media, but just a better modeling of the data the retailer had available to them, which was things like last year's sales and um, some other variables. And then the gray line is using social media. So you can see um, it doesn't go from ignorance to clairvoyance, but there is a significant improvement in accuracy from using social media, something like maybe one third drop, okay? Um, if you compare blue line versus gray line. Um, this is the genes fit results. Uh, and here, uh, there, was, there was actually a big improvement. So um, the blue line was the current forecast and the green line was, um, using the full model and that cut forecast error by more than 50%, okay? Now let, let's come back to this really interesting question. How does fashion work? So here's one view. You're wearing the sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room, okay? We could add the Pantone color of the year idea, the top down, uh, the, the, the small number of people in the world figure out what we want the hot colors to be next year. And they make pronouncements and advertisements. Um, it's, I forget that I should have looked up the Pantone color of the year. It could be that, or it could be cerulean, right? Or is it bottom up, okay? So here's my favorite example of bottom up, uh, the tie dyed t-shirt. And interestingly enough, this was an anti-fashion statement. That guy probably was, picture was taken in the 60s or 70s, but now uh, people actually sell it. Um, so here you can actually buy it. And what I found amusing, I don't know if it shows up on the screen, uh, but it, I think somewhere in this ad, it says that the, yeah, images may be subject to copyright. So here we've got anti-fashion. You're not going to tell me what to wear. And now the fashion industry, it's one of the things they sell and they actually copyright it. Okay. So which is which is the model that is most, and it's obviously a blend, but which is the biggest influence? Is it the fashion industry saying what to wear? Or is it that guy right there saying, you don't tell me what to wear. I'm going to be Mr. Anti-Fashion, okay? Um, so circling in the genes fit I showed you before, we could segment, we looked at all the different streams. So we had tweets, retweets, favorites, um, Google search, and uh, I guess we didn't have Google search here. And then we had all the data, but the gray bar is uh, retweets and favorites. So that we could think of that as a bottom up signal. Someone receives a tweet and they say, you know, I like that color. I'm gonna send it to all my friends. The orange bar is the initial tweet. So you can think that of that as the top down model. And then the green bar is, is everything. And the inference I would take from this is it's more bottom up than top down, that the bottom up messaging uh, as a 16% error, the tweet, if you only use the tweets, what industry is, is proposing, you get more like a 22% error. Uh, and then of course, using everything, you get 12.8. Uh, here's a similar idea for, uh, for the, 
three retailers to apparel to footwear where we were predicting color. So this this was jeans fit. This was color. And again, the gray bar is bottom up. In this case, it's tweets, it, it's retweets, favorites, and Google search. So it's all the, the actions individual people took expressing some kind of color preference. And the orange bar is the outbound tweet. It's what the industry was suggesting people would wear. And then the far right bar is using everything. And again, uh, the bottom-up messaging was more predictive than top-down. Uh, they're both reasonably predictive, and it's not all one or all the other, but it would seem there's a kind of, and I think social media maybe is partially driving this, there's a kind of a democratization going on with fashion, that people are deciding what they like, uh, and therefore what they buy and what they tell their friends they like and what their friends buy, uh, to a greater extent now than the industry telling them what to wear. Uh, I reached out uh, to a couple of, of friends. Uh, Brian Eshelman uh, is now at a consulting company, but he was CEO of Aldo Shoes uh, at one point. You can read what he said there, but... Uh, that customer retweets and favorites would be most predictive uh, makes perfect sense to me. Uh, the more fashion, and uh, one reason that's true is that retailers like newness and bold new colors, and that's what they advertise, but customers tilt more towards safer, more boring colors, okay? Um, so that they're tweeting about the radical fun colors as a way to draw attention to the brand. But then, and some people buy those, but and they may get drawn into the store, but uh, in the end, there's a reversion to the, to the mean a little bit of buying uh, more traditional colors, okay? Uh, and here's uh, Yoko Ohara, who uh, was a senior exec at a, at a Japanese apparel company, or actually, Asahi Chemicals, a textile manufacturer, and led, uh, created a school on, on fashion and, uh, and herself worked at predicting colors. And she said, you have to be careful predicting unusual color style. When something very new comes out, people tend to overreact. In the course of my career, I made these mistakes. They did not sell as well as I expected. When it comes to Real purchase, customers question twice. Uh, and then Edwin Kay, who heads the Hong Kong Research Institute of uh, Textile and Apparel, uh, at one point headed, supply, headed sourcing for Walmart. So he was really running the biggest supply chain in the world. And he made an interesting point that uh, a generation ago, fashion trends were top down. There were powerful influencers, uh, influential designers who dictated trends using their fashion shows. Um, Coco Chanel, Christian Dior, Armani, you could add Mickey Drexler. Uh, there are no modern equivalents. So obviously I, I picked my, my three favorite experts, but the, both the data and I think the, these commentaries are showing that partially driven by uh, social media and people able to exchange their color preferences or fashion preferences. There's a kind of democratization of fashion where it's driven less by you're wearing the color we the people in this room pick for you. That's still an influence and more by uh, people expressing themselves, the, the tie dyed model, okay? Um, any questions, reactions at that? Uh, So maybe just to recap at this point, we were looking at how to use tweets as an input to a forecast model that would predict the amount that would sell of each style color item. Uh, and we worked with three retailers, two apparel, one footwear. And we found um, looking at color and then 
with one retailer also genes fit and we found some meaningful reduction in forecast error uh with color there were the uh, four inputs tweets retweets favorites and google search and we only had the first three with genes fit and then the as, as interesting as this is a tool that could help companies was it provided, I think, some insight into what's going on in the fashion world, which it's a blend of top down, bottom up. But I think some time ago, maybe 10, 20 years ago was and, and earlier predominantly top down. Um, the Merrill Street, you're wearing what we told you to wear. But that's shifting to more democratization of fashion. Okay. And I've got a couple more uh, slides on some refinements to the model, but maybe at this point I could take any questions or comments. You can go ahead and unmute yourself if you would like to engage comments. So, Dr. Fisher, have you? Um thought about how this could apply to other industries or other situations? Um, no, I'm challenging you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, there, there's um, social media, you know, like you said, can predict with a certain lead time in this situation. Um, it seems like there'd be an opportunity to see, test that in other areas, you know, in other. I think that's an excellent idea that this research is is interesting within the context, but I hope it's also a little bit interesting in showing that, uh, and I was, uh, confess, surprised, that this particular social media was really helpful uh, in improving uh, forecasts. And that may be one third improvement in accuracy. If you figure that could cut over a production by a third. Uh, which is which is a big deal, uh, uh, and would also improve in stocks. There are certainly lots of industries where uh, you need to predict things, you need to predict demand. Uh, there's other social media. Obviously, there's Facebook posting, there's uh, Instagram, there's Twitter. Uh, but I got to believe I, I my eyes were opened by this research that that's if part of predicting what you're going to sell is understanding consumer behavior and your consumers are talking about attributes of the products you sell that's got to be helpful yeah uh, as a consumer myself you know I depend a lot on the reviews of other consumers to know whether or not I'm going to purchase a product and you know the, uh, manufacturers can inundate the market with what they think that the consumer will want or they can utilize the 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 endless uh available information that's on the internet and uh how the consumer works um consumer reports for example is a good example of that and uh analyzing the data and make, making sure that the information is available whether you're buying a car a dishwasher or a piece of clothing yeah absolutely yeah um and i think what zara shows is the best thing you can do is have a short lead time you, you produce yeah. things as they're selling but there's a fair number certainly in apparel footwear is most footwear apparel retailers have not been able to adopt this arm model. So if you're stuck with a long lead time where you've got to predict well in advance of the sales season, then I think looking at social media can be helpful. Okay, um, a couple more thoughts. Um, That's actually a really good point. Um, has anyone you know, really thought about an all-in analysis of, of what they call in, inshoring versus kind of out? Offshoring, yeah. Offshoring, yeah. About it. You're right. A lot of people make that simple calculation you mentioned earlier, and they <clears throat> developed a good way to understand the the shorter lead time benefit. We, we had that debate in our company. We buy uh, materials from China. We assume that the cost differential will outweigh any benefit of shorter lead time, but we didn't really have a scientific approach 
Right. Right. Be, because you know cost, but it's hard to know the benefit of lead, a shorter lead time. Exactly. Except COVID changed a lot, right? Because we saw the, the dramatic impact of having uh, that supply chain elongate further yeah. and even harder. How yeah. do you think you guys saw St. Clair? Did you have a statement or a question? Well, let me react. Yeah. Can I just react to Mark? Oh, just yes, more of a, a, a comment. Um, Could I, I react yes. to Mark? Yes, say Marshall, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so Zara produces 40% of their stuff in China and long lead time countries. They're more basic things. And they get the same three, four months lead time as everybody else. And then for 60%, they use what they call proximity production. And it's interesting, if you look at uh, the three spheres of the world, look at Europe, uh, Americas, and Asia, each of them have uh, low cost countries where you could produce. Obviously, Mexico, uh, Central America, some South American countries for North America. Europe has uh, Morocco, uh, where Zara produces a lot. You've got uh, you know, some of the other Eastern European countries, Romania, Poland, <clears throat> um, and then of course Asia with a lot of low cost production, as well as uh, high income markets like Japan and, and more and more China. So I, I think, Mark, it's doable to, to have your, as to some extent, have your cake and eat it to produce close to the market and still access less developed countries where you get more ways of. People have struggled to make Mexico work, Mexico, Latin America. And, um, the culture there places, I'm told, more weight on family and friends than on the efficient workaholic. And that maybe just really fast income. Anyway, is that a comment helpful in your good question, Mark? I think so. Yeah, this is uh, St. Clair. I just wanted to make um, a comment. Uh, I pretty much grew up in retail uh, on uh -huh. the logistics and fashion side. I worked for uh, Brooks Brothers uh -huh. early in my career. And, you know, Brooks Brothers, very traditional. You know, a, a, Brooks, a Brooks Brothers, you know, blue blazer never goes out of style. And then later on in my career, I worked for Foot Locker, where it was all fashion and different colorways and quick turnover, et cetera. So I think uh, the whole lead time process and uh, the top down as opposed to bottom up uh, definitely depends on what type of fashion that you're in also, as opposed to say a traditional uh, men's and women's retailer or a footwear and apparel uh, fashion retailer. Yeah. Were you at Foot Locker when Ken Hicks was there? Yeah, I was there until uh, 2008. Okay. Okay. Ken, Ken was a good friend. And uh, I'd actually written a paper in which Foot Locker figures prominently. And when I graduated from college, I started a job and had a few bucks in my pocket. One of the first things I did was to buy a Brooks Brothers suit. Brooks Brothers suit never goes out of style. It, well, I that was, this was long enough ago. It didn't go out of style. It just wore out. <laughs> but thank you for your comments. Okay, any any other comments or questions? A couple just final thoughts. That um, you, one thing that surprised us is that usually when you get closer to the event you're trying to predict. You're, you, the, there's a belief forecasts become more accurate. We didn't see that. Uh, as long as you did not have any sales data, as long as the forecast was prior to the start of the season, you could be one week before you, the sales season began or three months. And there was essentially no difference in accuracy. Okay, And I guess as we thought about it, it's not time that matters, it's your information state. And um, one week before the season starts, before you see actual sales, actual sales is a huge uh, additional input that improves accuracy. But until you get that, 
uh, you're as dumb about what's going to sell one week before the season as you are three months before. So that was one point. Um, the the other thing that was kind of interesting is that uh, for one of the retailers, they sold in the EU and the US. And so we could look at um, results in the two markets. Uh, and if you look at the EU market, uh, most of the improvement came from better analysis of existing data. Whereas in the US market, uh, most of the improvement came from using social media. Okay. Now, if you look at the uh, distribution of sales in those two markets, I don't, I don't know why this is true. It's what we saw. Europe is more normal. And the US tends to be more skewed to, I guess that's called skewed to the right, where uh, you'll you'll have a lot of things that don't sell very well at all, and then you'll have some things that are red hot. And I guess social media is more helpful with that kind of demand curve because you can spot the, the small fraction of your sales that are gonna be red hot and winners, okay? Um, and there's another analysis Yaron did where she looked at um, the um, different components of our of the independent variables, which which independent variables were most predictive. Um, interestingly, the most useful was the retailer's actual forecast. So one of the inputs to her model was what the retailer predicted they thought would sell. That was the most useful. The marketing budget was the other sort of traditional data that was useful shown in red. But everything else that was useful to improving the forecast on the top 10 list was social media related, okay? So, so some things coming from the retailer, two of them, number one and four on the list were, were valuable. But, but social media added a lot. And six of the top 10 features were bottom up. Again, somewhat supporting this fashion. What drives fashion is changing over time. Um, and then this is for the genes fit model. And we see a similar picture. Uh, so maybe our concluding thoughts is that we found in this one context, social media to be um, really useful. Uh, for improving forecast accuracy. Uh, it was pretty robust across retailers' markets and a range of prediction horizons. Uh, and then we could think a little bit about what drives fashion change. Is it top down, bottom up? And what is the causal mechanism for this enhanced uh, prediction? And the tweets themselves are kind of like, we thought, like advertising, right? So that's sort of telling, like the Pantone color of the year. It's telling people, this is, this is what you should wear if you want to be in style, and this is, and you want to look good at the next party. You, you should wear this, okay, got it? That's the tweet. Uh, and the retweets favorites Google search index could be viewed as a kind of consumer poll because we consumers are tweeting or searching on the colors that they like and find appealing. And so it's not surprising that those things would be predictive because the customer is kind of telling you, if you were to poll them, which colors do you like? They're kind of telling you that. Okay, so that that's um, my story. I think we're scheduled to end at 7.15, right? Um, and if there's further actually, questions, actually, um, we have a runtime as late as eight, um, but uh, we we are definitely open to staying as long as as every as you prefer, um, and uh, opening up the floor to questions. Is that your desire? Well, let's open it up for any questions, and then um, um, I will say thank you very much for the chance to visit with all of you.